And we begin the news in Nigeria's northwest, where relief washed over Kaduna State on Sunday as the military announced a successful rescue of 137 out of the 287 students abducted from LEA Primary Sec School and Government Secondary School, Kuriga in Chuku, local government area, on March 7th. In a press statement, the Nigerian Army disclosed that the rescued students, 76 females and 61 males, were found in neighboring Zamfara State in a pre-dawn operation conducted in collaboration with local authorities and government agencies. These developments come amidst ongoing efforts to locate other hostages and dismantle criminal networks operating in the region. Where, while details surrounding the rescue operations remain scarce, the news offers a glimmer of hope for families who endured a harrowing wait for their children's safe return. However, authorities are yet to clarify the fate of any remaining students still in captivity. And joining me live for update on this developing story from Kaduna State is News Central's correspondent, Mavalos Obumuna. Mavalos, uh, good afternoon. I do know that uh, the sun at Northwest there is, uh, is blazing and hot, but can you give us a bit of update, get us up to speed as to the latest at the State House in Kaduna? All right, um, we're still standing by here at the government um, house in Kaduna State where we're still anticipating um, the coming of these school children that were rescued by uh, military effort in, in, in Zamfara State. For now, we've just seen a handful of uh, government officials, you know, at the Kaduna State Government House here. We've seen the village head of that Kuriga community. He has just arrived at the government house. We've also seen um, the traditional ruler of Chikum local government which is the local government area where that particular community is located. We've also seen the head of se security operatives. We've seen the commissioner of police. We've also seen the brigade commander, the Air Force commander, and the DSS commander here in Kaduna State all present here at the state government house. Of course, the state governor just arrived about 10 minutes ago with his deputy. So all we are waiting for are just the school children and possibly their parents who uh, should be on their way because they are coming in from Kuriga, uh, local go Kuriga community, and it's a two hours drive from that community to Kaduna State. So we are still expecting them and then also expecting the school children. Then, very importantly, we need to, you know, um, properly look at the numbers, the figures. We're having discrepancies in terms of what the real figures are, and you know that usually these things happen whenever we have situations like this. If you could remember when the Baptist High School owned happened, where the government is giving a different figure, the military is giving a figure, and then the school authority are also giving a different figure. For what we know, the military is saying 137, and the statement as released and signed personally by the state governor is saying 287. So when the governor comes in to brief the press, we'll know what the actual figures are. But now we'll still remain with the governor because he is the chief security officer of the state. So he should be in the right place to give us that number. So for now, we are still going with the number he has given us on his statement this morning. Hmm. Uh, and marvelous, it, it, it's, uh, it begs to ask the question, if the military is saying 137, and if their, their number is true, let's just, you know, just hypoth hypothetically, if their number is true, what would then be the fate of the remaining students that would be in captivity? Anyway, since it's a rescue operation, if we're actually going by the number of, I mean, it's 137, we have about, um, about 150 still remaining. And of course, you know, this rescue operation will be a gradual operation. And if you can look behind me very closely, you also see a handful of security people there who are also part of the rescue team that will be deployed to bring some of these children more. And of course, rescue operations are usually a gradual process and sometimes they come in badges. If you remember the one that ha happened in Baptist High School where about, you know, the first one about 100 was released, the second time about 36 was released. Gradually to all of them were released. But the government is committed that they will return all these children on hold. Avalos, thank you so much. We're going to come back to you as we understand that this is a developing story, but thank you so much. That's Mavelos Obomanu, our correspondent in Kaduna. Move away from that now and uh, continue this time, but with this time, it's going to be on security. And joining me on the news is the security analyst, Salahuddin Ashimu. 
and he joins me live today. Uh, Asalauddin, it's good to have you join me today. Thank you very much for having me. All right. The press release, rele uh, the press release that was issued by the Nigerian army states 137 hostages were rescued from their abductors. What is the likely fate of the remaining students still in captivity? Well, I think, first of all, it would be nice to begin by uh, appraising the military uh, for carrying out uh, this uh, very successful uh, operation. Uh, it suggests very clearly uh, that uh, we have a grasp of uh, what uh, such a rescue uh, truly looks like. Uh, and I think, again, uh, it also brings to the question the challenges that borders around data. Uh, you recall that even from the first day when this happens, uh, there is still some level of um, contemplation around uh, the exact number. And that is also uh, a thorough reflection of our society, uh, where we do not have uh, a thorough database of uh, what happens to us. Uh, but what I need to tell you is that um, if this is a deja vu, if this is deja vu, uh, it then suggests two things. One, that the rescue operations uh, was actually a little intense, and that uh, perhaps uh, the rest were used as a human shield uh, to escape military operations. Uh, that is the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis, very clearly, uh, will suggest that uh, it is actually a negotiation uh, that is ongoing. So it was not a rescue operation. It would then mean that uh, in the first phase of the negotiation, uh, as a measure uh, to suggest or demonstrate commitment to the negotiation process uh, that a particular number will be released. Uh, it is actually a stage in the negotiation uh, value chain that this uh, usually is the case as a way of also reaching uh, a confluence or a truce. Uh, in every rescue mission, uh, there, are, there is something that is very fundamental, and that is the reconnaissance. Uh, reconnaissance is actually uh, divided into two phases. Uh, the first phase is actually about um, the issue that borders around observation, and the second phase is actually an issue that borders around information. Uh, what were the information related to this entire process? I think it would be nice uh, to get those stage very clearly. Uh, it will tell us about local intelligence, the data, it will tell, tell us about the resources that were actually deployed uh, in this entire process. Uh, what were the knowledge, local knowledge, that were invested, uh, what were the available uh, local intelligence that supported the process. And all of these things are very useful, particularly for lessons. And then, of course, we get into the observation phase uh, that tells us around stability, uh, that tells us all about how these children are then processed, uh, what then happens to them. Uh, if you recall the Baptist High uh, School children, uh, they came in these numbers uh, only for us to find out eventually that some of the kids uh, deliberately decided that they weren't coming back. And that is the danger of allowing this kind of thing to happen consistently uh, because what happens, therefore, is that you have young people who begin to grow models in these uh, terrorists and see them as uh, those that they can actually want to uh, model themselves uh, uh, afterwards. So for me, I think it would be nice, uh, since it is still developing, uh, to know what exactly happened in the process, one that affect the uh, staggering uh, variation in the number, two, the method of the rescue operation, three, if indeed it was a rescue mission or it was actually a negotiation or indeed uh, it was actually an extraction uh, because all of these things are actually different. But the military are not very casual with words. Uh, so they say it was a rescue operation. So if it was a rescue operation, then what were the strategies for that rescue mission? Uh, right. Those were the issues that would then inform uh, why uh, these numbers were coming uh, in piecemeal. And you know too where the military would not obviously uh, divulge this whole this uh, information. information to the public. Until it is concluded. Right. So let us look out for it. Right. Salaudin, whilst, again, this story is, is developing, it's fast developing as, as we speak, right? And what we know is that, you know, they were, the hostages were found in Zampara State. And now, you're, you know, you're also indicating that it could have been a rescue mission. You know, it could have not been, you know, let's see what the, the army would say. Let's hear what they have to say during the press conference. But... I'm worried about what this indicates. Does this indicate a larger abduction trafficking network operating across state lines? Because then we now look at the border lines between Zampara and Kaduna State, if they were found, uh, if these children were found just loitering around in, in Zampara. 
Very brilliant question. Uh, it tells you very clearly uh, the vast nature of ungoverned species that we have uh, in this country. And then, of course, unfortunately, uh, because we have not also introduced technology into our policing arrangement, uh, therefore, we have seen uh, some level of uh, ungoverned species. Uh, Kaduna has a very vast forest uh, that transverse uh, all the way, uh, I, I will call the, recall the name of the forest, uh, it transverse all the way to Brinikebi, and of course, even outside the shores of this country, very vast belt, and it is very unpoliced. Uh, it is actually a den and a playground uh, for terrorists. And again, it is one of the reasons why we think it is very important that we begin to uh, look at the variations that comes uh, with policing state by state. And if you come to Kaduna, one of the things that I think that are required, uh, either the forest guard or the forest rangers, uh, that will be able to actually uh, use very unorthodox means or have uh, the Kaduna uh, Vigilante Service engage more uh, in those communal engagement. Uh, security is local, uh, policing also must be local. So the localized nature and the knowledge and intelligence must actually be born out of those who have a clear knowledge of the entire nature of the landscape. It's actually very vast. So you cannot bring a formal or a conventional arrangement to work in that particular space. And that is why the conversation around state policing is not actually a casting stone. Uh, allow states to be able to develop their own policing to suit their own context. And that, for me, has been the argument. That is the only way to safeguard it. But I tell you, there are vast forests in Kaduna that is unpoliced, that is actually an ungoverned space, and that particular space has become a playground for bandits, and that in itself has been on for a very long time. And just to also recall uh, that in any reconnaissance operations, location is actually very fundamental. How did these guys move with that large number, without any form of uh, anybody hindering them? It tells you very clearly clearly that we need to reawaken our policing infrastructure. We need to introduce technology into our security system that will be able to coordinate and give us coordinates of information or situations like this. Unfortunately, this happened and they moved a very vast nature. Traveling from Kaduna to Zamfara by road is actually about five hours plus. So for you to go on foot or to go on motorbike, this will have taken them over 12 hours to 18 hours. And it then makes you worry about how they were able to time, carry over it is actually unfortunate. children. And it makes you worry about how they were able to carry 200 children, transporting them from one state side to another state uh, completely. It's, uh, it's very worrisome when you think about the stats just displayed that way. Um, but Salahuddin, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short, but earlier on in your answer, you were talking about uh, whether or not negotiations must have played out and sort of to win the trust, they must have released a certain number of children that could be part of uh, the discussion on the table, right? If this happens, then what happens to the federal government's insistence that uh, there will be no payment, uh, ransom payment, or any payment of ransom? That, plus, looking beyond the incident, what security measures can be implemented to improve communication and response time in future of school abductions uh, uh, scenarios or better prevent uh, similar incidents? Because this is not the first or second. I mean, we, in our answers, our conversation as well with our correspondent, Mavalos in Kaduna there, we keep going back to former incidences of school abductions. And it's almost like it's, it's uh, deja vu. It keeps playing all over again. <sighs> Yeah, uh, uh, government everywhere in the world would always uh, abstain itself uh, from uh, negotiating with terrorists. If you recall, every government will continue to insist that uh, we do not uh, negotiate uh, with terrorists. But again, uh, they use back channels uh, to, to do so. Uh, if you recall that the governor of Kaduna State uh, had actually uh, erroneously uh, betrayed uh, the method they were using when he said uh, that uh, they had actually negotiate, they had actually hired a negotiator. Uh, and that was actually very premature uh, to have actually let out that information early. And that in itself has actually led to this entire speculation uh, that is not uh, giving the full confidence of citizens uh, in the statement uh, from the military. Uh, because the governor came out very clearly to say, look, uh, we never we hired a, ne a negotiator uh, that will lead in this process. But they Salahuddin, are you there? Salahuddin.
seem to have lost connection there with our analyst, and that security analyst, uh, Salahuddin Hashimu. We'll try to continue with that very insightful discussion. But moving on now, and still on more security matters, the Nigeria Police Force has confirmed the deaths of six officers killed while investigating the disappearance of three colleagues in Delta State. The Force's Public Relations Officer, ASP Ulumuiwa Adejobi, disclosed this in a statement on Saturday. Adejobi added that six other officers are still missing and five suspects have been arrested in connection with the killings. The FPRO identified the deceased officers as Inspector Abe Ulubumi, Inspector Friday Irure, uh, Sergeant Sudan Elisha, Sergeant Akban Aniet, Sergeant Aire Ko, and Sergeant Ejimoto Friday. He also identified the missing officers as Inspector Onoja Daniel, Inspector Onogu Felix, Inspector Emmanuel Okurafo, Inspector Joe Amidu, and Sergeant Moses Eduvie, as well as Sergeant Cyril Okorie. Away from security matters, socioeconomic rights and accountability project has issued a strong call to action to President Bola Tinubu, urging him to alt pension payments to former governors and their deputies. In the statement released today, Sarap reminds President Tinubu of a court ruling dating back to 2019, which ordered the federal government to recover pensions collected by former governors serving in various capacities. Justice Oluremi Ogu Toyubu uh, had in a ruling in 2019 in the Federal High Court of Ikoi, Lagos State, emphasized the need for accountability and compliance with the rule of law. However, Sarap highlights that previous administrations failed to implement this crucial judgment. In a letter addressed to President Tunubu, Sarap underscores the importance of upholding the judiciary's decisions and restoring public trust in the legal system. Students of the Nasara State University, Kefi, have described the stampede which led to the death of two students of the university as unfortunate uh, during the sharing of rice palli palliatives in the school by the state governor. Now, some students say the stampede was caused by the impatience of students who had been waiting since as early as 3 a.m. for the distribution to begin. Amadin Uli visited the university and tells us more. Shocking images from the National State University cafe as the palliative distribution of rice for students from south. <laughs> Many students were seriously injured and about to lose their lives. The incident started when they said the, the governor of Nassau State, which is A. A. Sule, wanted to share palliatives to help the students, which is to assist the students. But it it was supposed to be shared on Wednesday, so they postponed it to Thursday. These abandoned footwears belongs to students involved in the stampede. Each has its own story to tell. However, information from the school authorities say that the sharing of the palliatives was already thought out. About 8,000 bags of rice was supposed to be given to about 4,000 students. Now the students were meant to come in through this entrance into the convocation arena, get their bags of rice to per student, a handshake from the governor with a token of about 5,000 naira. Students with disabilities had already gone in, were already sitting on their bags of rice when the stampede began. It was horrible. And I did expect that from students actually. Because the security tried their best to make sure that everywhere was okay and secured, but lack, lack of uh, patience. Some students were not patient enough to wait and see what will happen. When it's around four, that's where everywhere got chopped up. So before morning, people were like try, trying to break in. So when the media, um, security advert cannot manage the student population, so that's when everything started. I expected that an event like this would come up. That was why when I noticed the stampede and everything, I just moved back. The student forcefully entered the place and started packing it, and there was crowd. And the crowd led to some people, when they are falling down, they were not able to stand up. So people, the crowd, the people that were coming inside, 
were just stepping on them and to just go and carry the rice. Some students say they are still left in shock following the confirmation of the death of the unfortunate ones. I was disappointed, but I'm alive. I feel sad because it is not easy for somebody to leave his home to, for, for a degree program. At the end, you didn't gain anything and you still lost your life in the process. It has happened. We, we don't have any choice. We don't know who to blame. It has happened. It has happened. Though Kam has returned back to the school campus, those who survived the ordeal will live to tell their stories. In Nasrara for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Nigeria's Borno State, the government has commenced construction of a third flyover in the state capital, Maiduguri, at the West End Roundabout. This urban renewal project of the Borno State government has garnered mixed reactions from residents, commuters, and shop owners. New Central's Umaru Kirawa completes this report. One of the busy areas in Maiduguri, the Borno State capital, the West End Roundabout, which connects Baga Road, Custom, Shehulamini Way and Kashim Ibrahim Way. I spoke to several residents, commuters and shop owners operating near the new flyover construction site at the West End Roundabout, and this is what they have to say about the infrastructural initiative. Traffic normally hold people here 30 minutes, one hour, but with this uh, uh, flyover now, I don't think that we are going to experience uh, hold up again in this West End Roundabout. I don't go to love. Peace and life. Our problem in this area and this West End especially is drainage. During rainy season, rainy season, water is everywhere. It's welcome development. And this flower, I think it will bring out a lot of development for us. Some Commuters also welcome the news as they hope the flyover will significantly reduce travel time and make their daily commute more efficient. 50% of the term of this contract was paid. Close to about 4 billion was paid. And there is a clause in the contractual agreement that there will be no variation. Temporary inconvenience is what the people plying the route have to embrace as the government insists that the project will be completed within the specific time frame. If this uh, work is going to answer it in one year, it is going to create more jobs, it, the town will look more aesthetic, and at the same time, your excellency will be reduced to reduce uh, congestion, traffic congestion in this area. This flyover that we are doing is not only for aesthetic consideration, but the most important thing is to reduce vehicular congestion around this area. And inshallah, we shall see how we shall also introduce some measures to completely eradicate or reduce congestion at post office before the end of my term, inshallah. The flyover is said to serve as a significant landmark in Maiduguri, boosting the city's attractiveness to investors and promoting commerce. In Maiduguri for News Central, Umori Kirawa. Small-scale women farmers in Nigeria have raised an alarm over an impending food crisis in the countries which is expected to affect about 31.5 million citizens. They say government must declare, declare a state of emergency on insecurity in the country, which is preventing women farmers from accessing their farms in order to avert a national hunger crisis. Amadin, we reports. It was a press conference by the Small Scale Women Farmers Organization in Nigeria. They raised an alarm over a looming food crisis in the country, saying that over 30 million citizens will be plunged into hunger between June and August this year. The 2024 CADA Harmonized Food Security Report predicts that approximately 31.5 million Nigerians will face food crisis situations between June and August. 2024, with 24.7 million already grappling with such conditions from March to May. They also revealed that the current economic hardship in the country is taking its toll on women farmers, as many of them can no longer cater for their families. The conditions of livelihood of most small women 
smallholder women farmers are deteriorating, reaching a point where we struggle to provide food, access health care, and afford our children's education. They are calling on government to provide grants to women farmers to help them avert the incoming food crisis. Grants and credit should be provided for small women farmers to avert current food crisis in Nigeria. Government should promote gender sensitive approaches to climate change adaptation and resilience building, recognizing the differential impacts of climate change on men and women in agriculture. They say government must declare a state of emergency on insecurity in Nigeria, which is preventing women farmers from accessing their farms. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadine Uyi. There are strong indications that the price of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, known as cooking gas, may rise further over the domestic supply gap. Cooking gas currently costs between 1,200 naira and 1,400 naira per kilogram across the country. And there are fears that the price may rise further due to scarcity, which marketers attribute to supply interruption. In Nigeria, is cleaner than other fuels such as kerosene, firewood, or charcoal. It does not produce smoke, soot, or ash, unlike these other foils, which emit harmful pollutants that can cause respiratory problems, eye irritation, and environmental degradation. But in recent times, the rising cost of liquefied petroleum gas seems like it will force the people to revert to the days of charcoal and kerosene. I bought gas last time, last year, December, uh, at the rate of um, 11,000 plus or so, yeah. So presently now, I don't know the cost of gas at the moment. It has not been cost effective at all, because it keeps changes like every two weeks to three weeks. It keeps increasing, so it's not easy. Formerly, we used to buy it in the cost of 600, 700, but now it has gone to 1,000, 1,004, 1,005. So it's difficult for me to afford it. According to our market research, the average price of cooking gas per kg in Lagos, Nigeria today is 1,300 naira. This means that if you want to refill a 12.5 kg gas cylinder, you will need to pay 16,250 naira on average. However, this price is not uniform across the country and may differ from one filling station to another, which makes one wonder what factors exactly are responsible for these price fluctuations. For a couple of months now, we've been seeing that gradual increase. The main reason that I can tell for the increase of um, gas prices is um, the long winter that they've had in some parts of the colder parts of the world, Europe, America. Um, they are just beginning to see the winter a bit, a bit. So maybe we'll see some cheaper prices because we all pay virtually the same prices for gas in the international market, and they need it for, um, to warm their houses, warm their offices over there. So um, our exchange rate crash, of course, has, has really pushed um, the prices. But if you look at it, the annual gas prices around uh, November to March, it's almost the same thing. It's because our currency has really crashed. That's most the most reason why we are paying so much for um, LPG. In the midst of the current economic hardship, the cost of cooking gas is one extra item Nigerians will definitely not want to add to their growing list of worries. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Unwili. We move on to health news as the World Health Organization has sounded the alarm on the staggering toll of tuberculosis in Africa as the region observes World TB Day. According to the World Health Organization's Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Matidusu Moiti, uh, approximately 2.5 million individuals contracted TB in the region in 2022 uh, alone, 
emphasizing the relentless pace of the epidemic. In her message for World TB Day, Dr. Mui Chi highlights the grim statistics revealing that TB claimed the lives of 424,000 people in 2022, equating to one life lost every minute. She noted that despite being preventable and treatable, TB continues to ravage communities, underscoring the critical need for collective action. The Delta State Government, South-South Nigeria, says it remains committed to repositioning the state health sector for quality service delivery as encapsulated in the government more agenda. This comes as the state begins an awareness campaign ahead of the human papilloma virus vaccination flag of exercise across the 25 local government areas of the state. New Central's correspondent Austin Azu brings us details. Experts say the human papillomas virus is a common infection, mostly spread through oral sex and can affect different parts of the body. Only high-risk forms of the virus can progress to cervical cancer. If there is persistent exposure and persistence of this infection over years, sometimes up to 15 years, there can be malignant transformation from the pre-malignant condition that the woman may have to full-blown cancer. And when it becomes a cancer, it is, uh, can lead to death. And it's very one of the commonest cancers we have among women. But how much do people know about this virus? No, I've not. What is it all about? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about the manner of virus. If there's awareness, I, I think females that are already exposed to a sexual life, they should be willing to come for that vaccination. If there is a massive awareness, people will come for it. Against this backdrop, the executive director of the state primary health care development agency led the state World Health Organization and United Nations Children's Fund's partners on advocacy visit the office of the chief executive officer of the state orientation bureau in Asaba to unveil the agency's plans and seek assistance in creating public awareness for the human papillomas virus vaccination exercise expected to commence in May this year across the 25 local government areas of the state. Now for the human papilloma virus vaccine, it is one of the surest approaches of curbing the possibility and likelihood of a girl or the female child coming down with cervical cancer in the course of a reproductive life. And we know, even as it is now, there is no definitive cure for cancer. The State Rotation Bureau boss and executive assistant on communications to Governor Sheriff Oboroworu assured the team that the Bureau shall leave no stone unturned in the area of sensitization campaigns to boost public awareness for the human papillomas virus vaccination exercise. The Governor is um, very much interested in improvement of health services. The government is investing so much in it, but what we need to do is to let our people know that they need to come and benefit, you know, from these uh, services that government is rendering. And that is the bottom line of the more agenda. Uh, the governor is a governor for all debtors. Cervical cancer in women requires consistent preventive measures, and the human papillomas virus vaccination is for the girl child between 9 and 14 years. In Asaba, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. Thank you.